Uh, Peter very nicely introduced you to the new and extraordinary tapestry in our collection, which if you had asked any of us, is there a chance that we would be able to find such a tapestry um, at the present day and uh, bring it to the United States? The answer would surely have been no. It's just one of those ex uh, extraordinary and unexpected opportunities, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, but one of our first tapestries provides inst uh, inspiration for the exhibition that we have currently at the Cloister's Search for the Unicorn. Um, it turned out to be literally a search, uh, looking for things in our own collection, the Metz collection, and uh, nearby collections that would open up for our audiences the subject of the unicorn. The unicorn tapestries are perhaps our most famous works of art and um, greatly beloved. And uh, I've come to ask myself, how is it that the Cloisters has existed for 75 years and we hadn't done an exhibition focusing on the subject of the unicorn? And, and I've actually come up with an answer to that. I think it's hard to be taken seriously sometimes on the subject of unicorns. And it may be that some of my predecessors we're loath to, to go there, as they say. Um, you know, you get things like unicorn cupcakes. Um, and um, so if, in, in an effort to be scholarly, perhaps someone uh, might have been afraid to venture down that path. But I, for whatever reason, decided to, um, that it would be a good idea nonetheless. Surely the um, sort of silliness that can surround the unicorn legend is something that the Cloisters has um, not entirely been uh, avoiding over time. Um, I'm showing you now an image from the 1956 Cloisters Festival, where you can see that there is a unicorn present um, being encouraged to come in the door of the Cloisters by someone in a sort of quasi-regal princess-like costume. That was in 56. Um, even the children look a little surprised by the silliness of the grown-ups. In the previous year's festival, they had a ring toss, uh, the idea apparently being to throw that ring over the horn of the unicorn. This is sort of variation on the pin the tail on the donkey theme. And when I first saw this image, I said to our, um, our librarian who's been uh, cataloging these archival photographs, why didn't they do, you know, pin the horn on the unicorn? And he said, well, they did. That was in 1953, but it seems that it went rather badly. If you look carefully, they were somehow uh, hesitant about uh, repeating that particular exercise. And the extraordinary thing is that the photograph was preserved. 1956. Um, so, sorry, 53. So there is a kind of... Um, silliness that can surround the subject of the unicorn, but make no mistake, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it was a very serious subject indeed. I'm showing you um, an image you, which when you come to the place to, to see our unicorn exhibition, you will see the image on the left. It is an, uh, an image of the unicorn. This is the text which is uh, in Latin by Conrad Gessner, a very serious guy. You see him there on the right. He was a medical doctor. He was a native of the city of Zurich and a professor at the University of Zurich. You can see that he is um, chosen to be portrayed here in scholarly uh, attire and it pronounced it uh, proclaims around his head that he is a doctor and a philosopher. He, he wrote the most widely read of all Renaissance natural histories. Uh, it was published in Latin, it was published in German, it was even translated into English in 1607. It's the first modern zoological work that attempts to describe all the known animals, and it has a very serious bibliography of natural history history writings. It's the first book that has illustrations of fossils in it. Uh, his work was done in five volumes. It included more than 4,500 pages of text uh, and 1,200 woodcuts. 
The volume devoted to quadrupeds was published in 1551, and the illustrations, he's very careful to say, are done from life or on the basis of a reliable authority. Now, most of what we might today call imaginary beasts um, are not illustrated, but I want you to notice that the unicorn is illustrated. Gessner tells us that his illustration is based on the description that he received. His reliable witness was a gentleman called Ludovicus Bartema, who uh, told Gessner that he had seen not one, but two unicorns when he traveled where? To Mecca. According to Gessner, the unicorn was to be seen in Mecca. Now, Gessner says that the reputation of the unicorn um, and the probability of its existence is best affirmed by the survival of unicorn horns. And you will see two of what were considered to be unicorn horns at this time in the Cloister's um, exhibition. Gessner says that the unicorn horn is uh, very valuable medicinally, either ground into a powder or if the horn itself is fashioned into a drinking cup. He further says that the unicorn uh, can purify a stream of water. That's a belief that is um, continued from a very, very early time in, in writings. And Gessner offers, over the course of several pages, detailed descriptions of the unicorn's horn and advice as to how you might distinguish between an authentic unicorn horn and a false unicorn horn. Now, a scientist today will tell you that the unicorn horn is, in fact, the tooth of a narwhal. A narwhal is an arctic mammal. Um, it has the capability of diving as deep as 1,500 meters under the ice and can remain submerged for up to 45 minutes at a time. It lives as long as half a century. It seems to me that the narwhal, as a creature that we recognize today, isn't any goofier a notion than a unicorn, a sort of horse-like creature with a horn. But be that as it may, the notion of a unicorn is a very ancient one. And I won't tell you all of the sources for the um, understanding and belief in a unicorn, but I will mention some of them, as they, some of them may surprise you and um, inform our notions of where they came from. In the account of Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, there's a discussion of the Hercynian forest, a huge forest described as being so big that it took nine days to cross it from the Black Forest in present-day Germany um, over towards present, uh, Bohemia, present-day Czech Republic. And the text says, there is no man in Germany we know of who can say that he has reached the edge of that forest. It is known that many kinds of wild beasts not seen in any other places breed therein. There's an ox shaped like a stag from the middle of whose forehead between the ears stands forth a single horn, taller and straighter than the horns we know. What I'm showing you is a print image of the triumph of Caesar by a printmaker called Jakob of Strasbourg. Um, despite his name, he was actually active in Venice in the early uh, 16th century, and he did this after the, uh, a composition by an Italian artist active in Venice, Benedetto Bodone. But we read that Caesar's triumph was not merely recreated in print images like this, but in fact enacted by students at the University of Caen in Normandy in 1513. I see this as a kind of proto-fraternity uh, extravaganza. A 13th century Persian physician, whose short version of his name is Al-Kazwini, believed that the horn of the carcadon, a term sometimes used in European medieval illustrations of the unicorn, he proclaimed it to be effective in curing illnesses 
as serious as epilepsy and lameness and as mundane as constipation. al Kazwini explains that Karkadan horn is an effective antidote to poison. And this text was widely disseminated. What I'm showing you here is an example from 18th century Mughal India. And the book itself comes from um, the library, the National Library of Medicine, uh, which is in Bethesda, Maryland. You may not know that our nation has had a National Library of Medicine since soon after the um, Civil War. The point being that these historic texts that talk about the medicinal properties um, of the sort of proto-pharmaceutical era, right, things that could be derived from, uniquely from nature. Narwhal tusks um, were safeguarded in churches from London to Krakow. Saint-Denis outside Paris possessed one that is said to have been given to Charlemagne in the ninth century by the Abbasid Caliph uh, Harun al-Rashid. That uh, horn is preserved, or what we believe is the same horn, is in the Cluny Museum in Paris today, which, as you may well know, is the home of the other great series of unicorn tapestries. St. Mark's in Venice acquired such a horn from Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, Charles VI of France, his uncle Jean-Duc de Berry, who has been, whose name has been evoked today, and Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, all listed unicorn horns among their prized possessions. And when Lorenzo de' Medici died in 1492, the unicorn horn in his collection was valued at 6,000 florins. So the point was that the horn itself was very precious. And we see here another um, printed book that is in the exhibition. It's a book of symbols and emblems by yet another doctor. You see that's the title page. He gives his name, Joachimo Camerario, uh, a, medicine, a, a doctor of Nuremberg. And you see that the unicorns figure very prominently at the bottom of the page. Then within the text, he has uh, several images of unicorns. You can see one here dipping its horn to purify the water. Uh, the author is, is exclaiming that nothing in here is going to go unexplained. Um, and then he further proclaims that what is useful is precious. No kidding, we just heard about the value of the unicorn horn in Lorenzo de' Medici's collection. Camerarius uh, corresponded with Gessner, doc uh, Dr. Gessner, whom we met at the beginning um, of this talk, and uh, Camerarius was actually asked to broker the sale of a unicorn to the city of Nuremberg. Now, where did that agent propose to find the beast? Well, obviously, it was very necessary to know what the habitat of the unicorn was. In the exhibition, we have this page from the Shahnama, the uh, Persian account of the uh, great deeds of, the, of their kings. And the Persians say that the unicorn, um, which you see here being slain, this one-horned beast being slain by Alexander the Great, is to be found in the land of Habash, that is, Ethiopia. For, mm -mm. there we go. For Breidenbach, Archbishop of Mainz, uh, the unicorn was to be found in the Holy Land. And you see here a page from the account of the uh, trip that he made. He was a sort of um, early cook's tour. Uh, he took a company of more than 100 pilgrims to the Holy Land, and he invited an artist to travel along to um, uh, document what they saw along the way. And you can see here that the animals of the Holy Land that they, that they saw, so I think you'll recognize there's a crocodile and a giraffe and a camel and some goats um, go called goats of India. And there proudly in the middle is the unicorn who is on a leash, um, a leash being led by a kind of uh, odd looking creature, sort of a very furry, uh, unshaven, character, um, and is the only one that he says, well, I don't really know what this thing is called, but he's the one who's in charge of the unicorn. And the text will tell you that the pilgrims saw unicorns, again, not just one, um, near Mount Sinai. And at the bottom of the image um, in the book, and unfortunately you don't see it in this particular detail, but it tells you very specifically that those animals are drawn after life. Now, you remember that whereas Breidenbach says that the unicorns are to be found near Mount Sinai, 
that Gessner told us that the unicorn was to be seen in Mecca. And there's this ongoing thing that the unicorn is always slightly beyond your own experience, right? It's somewhere that you know exists, but that you probably haven't been to yourself. So whether it's Mecca or whether for, from the perspective of someone in Persia, it might be Ethiopia. Pome, Pierre Pome, published another um, uh, history. This is actually a history of drugs by Pierre Pome. He was the pharmacist to Louis XIV, so a very prominent uh, fellow with quite an international reputation who traveled um, around the world. And he says, and you can see, and that I've underlined it in red, that unicorns, uh, of which he shows you five different types, one strangely with two horns, um, but he tells you about five different types and says that they're to be found in the Arabian Desert on the one hand, more specifically near the Red Sea on the other hand, but also again repeating the notion that unicorns are to be found in Mecca near the tomb of Muhammad. So if unicorns are always sort of somewhere slightly beyond the edge of the rainbow, perhaps you won't be surprised to learn um, that for Europeans at some point the um, habitat of the unicorn switched from the Near East to America. And here you see um, an engraving. This is a, a, a personification of America, whom you see here. This is our sort of politically incorrect item in the exhibition. Uh, the unicorns are drawing the chariot uh, with the emblem of America, this bare-breasted Native American woman with an exotic headdress, and the pair of unicorns pulling it. That's part of a series you won't be surprised to know that the chariot of Europe is pulled by horses, the chariot of Africa pulled by lions, the chariot of Asia pulled by a pair of camels, and America now is the homeland of the unicorn, whom you see curiously then with this, I guess that might be an armadillo at the front right-hand side. In the far distance, we have a un, very unpleasant scene of human sacrifice, um, but at the left, the more docile tapping of the maple tree for maple syrup. And this is not a unique example. There was a publication that came out um, by an early Dutch naturalist living uh, or who had traveled into the United States, this crazy new land. Uh, this was a publication of a man called Adrian van der Donk, uh, who was called Der Jonker, from whence the name Jonkers. He published in 1655 his scientific knowledge of the New Netherlands with illustration showing the local flora and fauna. And you see that the unicorn is there, right up there with the eagle. So we've come actually in, into Jonkers, not being so very far from the cloisters itself. And his text says, I have also been frequently told that far into the interior parts of the country there were animals of the size and form of horses, having one horn in the forehead. Because of their fleetness and strength, they were seldom caught. I don't want you to think that this ends, this search for the unicorn um, in the 1600s. Uh, I don't know if any of you may have noticed last fall the article that appeared in the Telegraph, also in the New York Times, the official news agency of North Korea, proclaimed that the lair of the unicorn has in fact been found in North Korea. Again, most of us uh, don't travel to North Korea, and I haven't had a chance to check this with Dennis Rodman, but apparently the unicorn is in fact in North, to be found in North Korea. In the absence of that kind of trip, um, I hope you might rather uh, come to the cloisters to see our exhibition of the unicorn in captivity and the other uh, tapestries in the series, as well as a number of um, pieces that you've seen this afternoon um, proclaiming the glories of the unicorn. Thank you very much.